I'm Mike Merithew, uh, prefer to be called Michael actually, but uh, you know, I was the uh, founder and uh, I should say co-founder with my wife, uh, Louise, uh, of Merit Travel, uh, in, uh, which originally started as a Uniglobe agency in 1991. Welcome to Voices of Travel, the next chapters, an interview series that captures the passion, humor, and character of 15 remarkable people as they tell us the stories of their careers in the industry. Michael, thanks for joining me. What was your first job in travel? Or I suppose, as you're a serial entrepreneur, can you tell me about your first business in the travel industry? Yeah, so the way we started really was um, I was uh, working in the graphic design and advertising business and uh, was looking for a business that, uh, A, I could afford to buy because we didn't have a lot of capital. We were younger then and uh, starting a family. And I was looking for a business that was sales driven and service uh, oriented where we thought we could have an impact. One of the options that I looked at was the travel industry. And lo and behold, that led me to a meeting ultimately with, uh, at the time, Frank Dennis, who had just uh, started as the um, regional franchisor for Uniglobe Travel. And uh, what we did, first of all, was we bought an existing, which was always my bias, if you will, to buy an existing agency. We bought an existing Uniglobe uh, agency and um, Uniglobe Advantage Travel in Mississauga and, um, and uh, started on uh, July 8th, uh, 1991. It was a different world back then in the 1990s. Can you talk about what it was like and whether you had any vision of where you wanted to go with that agency? Yeah, two, two big questions there, uh, the vision. Um, really, I just wanted to be able to make a living. Uh, I, ha I had no real sense of vision in the travel industry because uh, quite candidly, other than having traveled a bit myself on business and, and for personal, I didn't really know a lot about the travel industry in a way. And in a way, I think if I had known more, it might have scared me away because it was... <laughs> It was, uh, as I found, or found out or discovered uh, very quickly, it's a very complex uh, business. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, we, we spent a good amount of time really trying to figure things out. And, um, you know, initially in July 91, one of the very first things uh, that I did uh, was to go out and purchase um, a... a, a uh, plain paper fax machine, if you can believe it. That was sort of the latest technology at the time because the agency was um, had a had a photocopier on on coded paper. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I also made a commitment with uh, Saber for their accounting system. Now, keep in mind that this was an agency that wasn't even quite doing a million dollars a year in in annual turnover. And a lot of people thought I was totally crazy to, uh, why do you need an accounting system? You, you, you need to grow your business uh, first uh, before you make those kinds of investments. Um, and, uh, and I actually didn't really see it that way. The way I saw it was if, if we have an accounting system that will enable us to focus on growing the business rather than uh, administration and accounting and that kind of thing. When you came into the industry, you were an outsider. Was that an advantage for you? Uh, so in hindsight, I do think it was an advantage. Uh, clearly there's disadvantages because uh, really understanding the intricacies of the travel industry uh, are, are quite daunting. Um, uh, but I do feel like uh, uh, I was a relatively fast learner and, uh, and I really absorbed uh, what I could by attending Uniglobe Franchise Owners Association meetings and networking with, uh, with people from the industry and, and colleagues uh, who were in the same situation as me. Um, but where I think I had a huge advantage was um, I, didn't, I didn't get into the travel business, the travel industry, um, 
in the context of being a practitioner. I've never made a reservation in my, in my life to this very day. And in fact, one of the other commitments that we made uh, literally in the first uh, month or two of starting uh, owning the agency was to hire a manager to manage our two full-time staff and part-time people so that I could do what, what I felt I was better at doing, which was uh, sales, uh, marketing, business development. Um, and so really I looked at the industry, uh, and the business as a business and, um, and not uh, per, uh, per se as a practitioner, that is to say somebody, uh, uh, making travel reservations and so on. That's not to say that I didn't have uh, incredible respect uh, for those people. In fact, uh, I could never do what they, uh, what they, uh, uh were able to do and did for us, uh, performed for us, but it was not my skill set. And so really, I think um, uh, uh, I've always believed that uh, people should really stick to their knitting and, uh, and do those things that, uh, that uh, are their areas of strength. And uh, that's what I did. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, touch wood uh, that together with a lot of other um, uh, opportunities, I guess, uh, resulted in us uh, uh, having the success that we did. I'm interested in the merit story. You morphed a single agency into a business that did corporate leisure, specialty travel, and lots more. There are agency models that are doing that now. Did you have a master plan? Did the vision come to you one night when you woke up and said, oh, this is what I have to do? No, it's uh, again, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. You know, you, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are supposed to have this, uh, this great vision about the future and what it looks like. Um, uh, re for me, I would say the biggest motivator was fear, uh, fear of uh, failure, fear of not growing enough. And, um, and, uh, but what I did start to identify was the value, much like investing, the value of diversification. And so um, rather than, I guess, um, looking at the industry uh, as, a, as a sort of a, uh, a one-legged stool or an agency being a generalist, if you will, in leisure travel or corporate uh, in those sectors, um, I really saw the opportunity as being in specialty or multi-specialty or in, in the whole area of specialization. And I don't know, it just, it was a matter of, um, again, traveling to meetings, talking to different people, looking at different business models and saying, oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of the vision, um, if, if I can describe it that way, uh, was a journey. Uh, it was a path that we followed. And as we know, uh, journeys or paths uh, seldom are a straight line. And uh, so you, you, uh, you waver and wander and, uh, and, you, and you, uh, you make mistakes as we did, uh, but at the same time you, um, you find your way and you find out what works and uh, how it benefits uh, the company. And ultimately, you know, we ended up with a business that was uh, very diversified. I just, we just somehow felt a little bit more secure that in that, uh, in that way. But we also uh, really saw the synergies between the different business units. Um, you know, we had a very, uh, I, I would say very strong orientation towards air and that supported us in our specialty tour business, whether it was our group departures, whether it was our ski business, our golf business. Um, and certainly it helped us when ultimately we moved into the loyalty uh, space um, uh, shortly after 9-11, where uh, airline tickets uh, for the credit card loyalty business were, uh, were, a, were a very, um, very important element. You were also an early adopter, and I wanted to talk to you about technology. I mean, technology has always been part of this business, but the internet created some waves social media has arrived and now there's AI. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about technology and the role it played with the businesses that you operated. When we looked at technology, it was really from the standpoint of um, uh, improving productivity and enhancing customer service. I mean, it really, it really was. Of course, uh, by the late 90s, 
the whole idea of the OTA or the online travel agency and people booking online was uh, was starting to get a, a pretty strong footing, and um, and you could you can very obviously see as a as a business person the um, the productivity potential productivity gains that came from using technology and automation. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, every business is about economics, and so the technology for us was an enabler. Of, um, of improving the economics and the productivity uh, of the business. I'll never, I'll never um, forget, I mean, in very round numbers, um, when we first started the business, a, a travel consultant was typically generating about a million dollars a year in, in volume, if you will, in transactions. Um, of course, there's a number of transactions associated with the average ticket value is a factor there, but, uh, uh, but, but, Later on, very few uh, short years after that, the average consultant was generating uh, in excess of $4 million uh, in annual volume. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. It comes about as a, as a result of technology and automation, productivity tools. And we tried a lot of them. There were a lot of companies coming out of the woodwork who had, uh, who had uh, uh, great solutions, uh, they claimed. Um, and inevitably, it, uh, it, it meant that we tried things that didn't work. We spent a lot of uh, money um, and, uh, and a lot of time uh, trying things that uh, failed and that ended up being a lot more expensive than we thought. But we kept, but we kept go going because I think we felt that uh, that investment in automation and technology was important. However, I'll never, I, you know, we never lost sight as a company, as Merit Travel, uh, we never lost sight of the importance of customer service. And, and, there, and there were certain types of travel that, uh, that lent themselves, um, and still today lend themselves to, um, to online bookings or, or uh, more automation. Um, but there's a, a number of areas uh, of specialization, uh, specialty travel, that uh, where the the travel consultant who is uh, uh, in my mind uh, uh, you know um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, you know the respect that we had for our travel consultants was utmost because it's amazing what they could do and what they could achieve for uh, customers that simply could not be done online and still cannot be done online today. There have been a lot of changes, a lot of disruptions. And I have a couple of questions about this. First, what would you say is the biggest change that you've seen during your time in the industry? And is it a change for better or worse? And the second part of the question is, would you consider yourself a disruptor? Yeah, there have been a lot of changes in the industry and I wish I, uh, having uh, been quote unquote retired uh, and, and away from the industry for just over five years now, um, uh, since we uh, since we left uh, Merit Travel, um, of course we've had uh, the COVID uh, journey, and uh, and I'm sure, and I know for a fact that that uh, just in in passing conversation with uh, many of my former colleagues, how challenging uh, that was uh, for them. Um, uh, very challenging indeed, and uh, and so I know that that uh, continued to uh, change the industry. But even before COVID, um, you know, we, we are very quick to look at the temptation of thinking that automation and technology is, a, is an end in itself, uh, rather than an enabler or a means to an end, as I mentioned earlier. And I think, you know, my concern is, and it still is today, that when I contact uh, companies who are making extensive use of automation or technology, um, more and more, you just want to be able to talk to somebody who can actually help you. Um, in, a, in a very, very simplistic way, I, I do remember very vividly um, when we introduced voicemail. Uh, to our business, uh, because uh, prior, of course, it, we ju you just uh, you just answered the phone um, and served your customers or put them on hold, and of course, um, you know, uh, in some respects, um, 
I and we resisted voicemail for quite some time because we always felt that customers didn't want voicemail, they wanted voice. And, um, and uh, by that I mean, of course, when they're calling you, it's because they have a, a, a need um, and, uh, and they want it addressed um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, there's uh, too often um, a, I'm gonna say a um, temptation to hide behind voicemail or even email today um, and the, all the associated potential delays that it, that it results in. And I, and I, and I, um, and I do like, I'm not a Luddite to uh, quite the, quite the contrary, as you, as you suggested earlier, uh, we were very much an early adopter with respect to technology, but you, as I said, you really need to remind yourself of why you're implementing the technology and what, what it's really for. If you think it's for just, um, somehow reducing your costs by hiring fewer staff, you're missing the whole point of it. So my concern, I think, going forward is where does this, uh, where does this go? And of course, uh, you know, the most topical uh, subject in that regard right now is AI and, um, and uh, the extent to which AI will and is being used already today in travel. Um, but there's still uh, uh, there are still um, uh, people out there who want to talk to somebody and, uh, and that's becoming increasingly difficult and that concerns me a bit uh, because we are very much in the personal service business. Ultimately, people are coming to us to fulfill their dreams and aspirations. Um, it's not a cliche. It's, uh, it's really what it's all about. And so that experience that they're looking for, um, whether it's that family trip to Italy or whether it's that, uh, that uh, personal uh, uh, sort of uh, journey uh, um, uh, on a trek uh, in the Himalayas, um, it's very personal. And uh, that's not just about automation and technology. It's about, it's about uh, really connecting with your customer. Well, I guess if you're talking about your dreams, you want to talk to a person to get some reassurance about those dreams and whether they're doable, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's, it's scary. The, it's, it, in some respects, it is, it is uh, mind-boggling, the amount of uh, information that's available online today in, in search. Um, but uh, you only have to look at, uh, in general, no, no offense uh, to your group, but the, to look at media today and to look at the difference between news and, um, and fake news. And, uh, and I'm not just uh, citing uh, something that's uh, obviously been a long conversation in the United States and the U.S. with respect to politics, but it's like you read something and you don't really know what's true and what isn't true anymore. And so I think um, uh, having a personal connection a relationship with somebody who is knowledgeable, who you do trust, who can help you sift through um, uh, all that information and noise in many respects and, and misinformation um, becomes even more critically important. So uh, again, it, it sounds like I'm a dinosaur and, uh, and talking about uh, how um, technology uh, is not helping us, but of course it is but we just need to remind ourselves of, uh, of why we're doing it and how we're using it. There was a question about were we a disruptor? Yes. Um, I, I would say that by nature, I've always been a bit of a contrarian. And so if contrarian is, uh, is some sort of a synonym for disruptor, uh, I suppose uh, that's what we are. We tried things that uh, others weren't trying. We did things that other people, other companies and firms weren't doing, um, not because we were necessarily smarter, but because we were willing to try them because we wanted to be different. Because if you're not ultimately different, you're the same. 
And if you're the same, then how do you differentiate yourself, your business, your company, your people from everybody else? I'll never forget uh, after 9-11, uh, when you were living it in the travel industry, it was, it was in incredibly impactful. And, um, and very, in a few short months after 9-11, when business was abysmal and we were losing money, uh, we made the commitment to invest in the, in the, in the credit card loyalty business, um, uh, purchasing a, a company uh, uh, literally from bankruptcy uh, because we saw the opportunity uh, long term in the future for um, travel loyalty programs. And, uh, and keep in mind, that was in 2001, 2002. Um, of course, loyalty uh, travel programs today are, you know, they're everywhere and every bank or credit card uh, has them in one form or another. But, uh, but uh, I won't say that they didn't exist very much back then in 2001, but they, but they were more, more in their infancy. And so to take the plunge into that space uh, at a time when we were already struggling to recover from 9-11 and make money, um, uh, honestly, um, and, and I say this with, with greatest respect, Lulu thought I was crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and perhaps I was. Uh, but it turned out to probably be the, the, the best and the most significant acquisition we ever made um, uh, at Merit Travel. What about advice for somebody interested in buying a business in the travel industry now? A person coming from the outside. What would you tell them? Run away? Don't do it? What's your advice? Again, it's a great question. Um, would, uh, would, how would I advise somebody uh, today uh, looking to get into the travel industry? Um, look, it's still a, it's still a massive, um, and uh, despite uh, the uh, recent uh, difficulties that we went through with uh, COVID and the impact on travel, it is still a massive industry and is and will continue to grow. It's a business that has a, a, an incredible future. The question is where? Uh, what are those elements of, um, of, uh, of competing in the travel industry, differentiating yourself in the travel industry, achieving the scale required in the travel industry going forward? How much capital would that require? Um, these are questions that people need to be um, uh, asking themselves and researching very carefully before uh, entering uh, the space. Um, but I would remain, I still today remain very positive about the travel industry. Um, in any business that is so massive, so global, so complex, um, uh, which has, which has, uh, thwarted and actually been daunting for uh, so many companies, large and small, uh, there is always opportunity. Last question, Michael. What's your vision for the future? What do you see a decade down the road? What's the industry going to look like? The travel business will not become simplified. Um, it was complex when we got involved and it is probably even more complex today. And, uh, and I see that only uh, continuing, that complexity. Um, and the reason is, and I go back to my sort of my basic marketing roots, is the number of segments that exist in the business. You know, when, um, uh, when uh, we first uh, uh, saw the growth or the advent of the internet and online bookings, um, uh, still today, people talk about how the opportunity to sell an online ticket point to point, domestic or transborder, or even ultimately to Europe, um, was online was low hanging fruit because it was pretty simple and straightforward. That's absolutely true and absolutely the case on the surface, on the surface, until you want to make changes until you really want to understand the, the uh, rules and the fair rate and the regulations associated with the ticket that you've purchased. 
And then good luck with the changes. Who, who, who are you going to contact and make those changes easily? Um, and, um, and so, um, because it is, because there are so many different market segments serving so many different customer types, traveling to so many different parts of the world and, and visiting different parts of the world in a different way. It's not uh, that we're going to have complexity. So it's not just going to Italy. You know, are you going to Italy by yourself? What are you going to do? How long are you going to stay? What kind of accommodation are you looking to stay in? Um, uh, are you going with your family? What activities are you looking uh, to, to uh, get involved in? Um, and on and on. Um, and by the way, how much time do you have really to research that yourself? Some people love it. They thrive on that research online. They just love the Google, the Google as Lulu calls it. Um, and, uh, and they love doing that trip planning themselves. And it's all great until they miss something or it's all great until uh, they need to change something. Or, um, uh, and, and so it, do you have the time? And not only do you have the time, but do you have the expertise to really separate the quality, correct, accurate information from what's not always so accurate and correct? I've always called it the mistake business. So when mistakes uh, happen, who are you going to get by the throat? The, o the, the online world, the web, how do you get them by the throat exactly to help you resolve something that has gone wrong? We, we, we underestimate the problem solving ability. The, we underestimate the problem solving ability of those travel consultants. And the, you see, in, at one level, they provided us with, shall we say, reservations and bookings and itineraries and fairs and so on. Some of them were more knowledgeable than others and uh, good companies uh, invested and continue to invest today in the training of those people to, to provide those services. So, you know, again, it's how do you want to, as a, as a traveler, as a customer, how do you want to spend your time? Um, so coming back to your, your original question or point about the future of, uh, of travel, the complexity is not going away. The AI and the technology is not going to solve for everything. Uh, it is not going to necessarily solve uh, the, the, do the problem solving for the mistakes that occur prior to, during, and even sometimes even after your journey when you find that you've been double billed for something inadvertently. And for those people, who see this great opportunity to, to make their own arrangements, um, uh, I, I applaud their enthusiasm and their energy uh, and their resilience. Uh, I still think, however, that there's a large, and there are large segments of the market that still wanna deal with a travel consultant. So that's to say that I believe that the, the ideal model is a hybrid model utilizing the technology that's available today for certain transactions, certain types of travel, certain types of customers. There's also, um, for that same company, an opportunity to add value with uh, highly trained, better paid travel consultants, travel professionals. And, uh, and so depending, again, on how you're looking to enter the industry, um, at what scale, uh, because scale is, is critically important today. Um, uh, where is the capital coming from? Um, where is the investment coming from? Um, that should help you, uh, understand what the potential points of entry might be for you. Because if you have a limited amount of capital and you're looking to enter what is obviously a very competitive or lucrative space that, that potentially requires significant investment capital in automation or technology, AI tools, and so on. 
um, but you don't have the capital. That's not, that's not where you want to be. So, I mean, it all sounds obvious, but you really need to pick your spot and, uh, and be very vigorous in your analysis about, um, about, um, what you're looking to achieve and what your um, capabilities are, both financially and from a management uh, standpoint. Thanks for telling us your story, Michael. And thanks to all of you for joining me for this episode. I'm Bob Mowat, Executive Editor of Canadian Travel Press, and I hope you'll join me for another remarkable conversation on Voices of Travel, the next chapters.